Joe likes Scorsese and Ranan is Jewy. It's Joe and Ranan talk movies. How come you're dead center? Ready? <laughs> Three, two, one, clap. All right. How come you're in the middle? I don't know. We're not doing this with Lex, so it's chaos. You're straight on. I'm felt. No, leave the pillow. Come on. <laughs> Lex could Wait, not. Wait, you take the pillow? I don't you know. put it between us. I feel like. There's too many pillows. These pillows are so big. I Move the like... pillow over. You're too big. <laughs> I uh... I feel like I'm not. Am I in frame? <laughs> I don't know. Fuck, you're Let me in look frame. at the frame. Let me you're, look at the frame. No, you're in frame. I got to see the frame. Goddamn Lex couldn't re- record today for some bullshit reason. Oh, that looks good. So now I got to I'm recording this. I'm you're a filmmaker. This. Yeah, I'm you're like a Coppola. You're I'm a wannabe this. filmmaker. All right, we are back. Finally, uh, I've been trying so hard to record. Ronan's <laughs> always busy, yeah. too busy. Did I? Did we tell the story on the podcast already? But when I gave you a Holocaust book and you read it in four days, and then you told me you were too busy to write a film while we were, I was holding my baby. <laughs> we talked about that on something. What was that? Yeah, where was that? I don't know. I yeah. might have just talked about it on Tuesdays without you. Oh, maybe that was it. Um, but uh, but yeah, what is this? Which one? Joe and Ron on top. By movies. the way, first and foremost, first topic. I'm sitting in my house the other day, watching the Boston Bruins, enjoying my life. The baby's asleep. We're sleep training. We're knocking out of the park. We're the best parents of all time. Mm-hmm. Meaning in my life. Sarah goes, "Hey, uh, have you seen this?" I go, "What?" I turn. She shows me a thumbnail. Ron on talks movies <laughs> with Nathan McIntosh. <laughs> I almost shit. I almost came to the house. I almost kicked the door in. What is that? This was my podcast. I created this. I brought you I in. This is going to be a gotcha episode. I brought you in. This well, I started the show. I had to do something for this movie episode. But you had to call it Ron on Talks Movies? I with said Ron on Talks Horror Movies. You know what? Someone was saying. Oh, that's a lot different than Joe and Ron on Talk Movies. <laughs> Can I tell you, Kate, my girlfriend, she was like, why don't you call it Ron on and Nathan Talk Horror Movies? I'm like, no, that would be an insult to Joe. Yeah, but it's called Ron on Talks Movies with Nathan. It's like a spinoff. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Well, what am I supposed to do? I, I every call sh- it something else. Every show I do, people are like, "What are we going to bring back? This? When are you going to bring back Joe and Ron on?" I'm like, "I'm ready. I'm ready anytime." I know, but I want to write a film, and you're over there writing your own film <laughs> Which- without me, <laughs> and you're raising money, and I'm involved in every fundraising <laughs> thing. It's literally, it's unbelievable. You might be one of the all-time worst friends. It's shocking. What? I'm like, let's quit the movie podcast and make a film. And then you don't want to write the movie we're writing because you want to direct a movie, which is, by the way, I've told this to multiple people and they're like, that is a really short-sighted, selfish, dumb thing. For me to be director? To not work on a different project. It's like I, me I not making the movie. It. It's like me not making the movie it. with Louie because I'm like, well, I want to direct, no, so I'm not going to star I'm, and produce. I'm open to work on it. We're going to write it together. Let's write and it. You, there's a role where you would play a I, character. Fat friend. Yeah, let's write it. Yeah, the it. fat, dumb, <laughs> annoying friend. I'm, and open, then, I'm open to writing it. I am open. You are the one who decided to have a kid and you killed both our dreams. And you, so then, so listen to all this. So I'm like, we got to make a movie, not talk about movies. We're not critics. So I say, quit the podcast. You go on. Continue to do the podcast a while, while writing a, your own movie, <laughs> refusing to write mine, and asking me to raise the funds. <laughs> it's on. It's literally unbelievable. I'm raising funds for your movie that you're working on, despite I'm me trying to make a movie. Back here. You never mentioned any of this before. The we, I we, forgot. We, we set up. You're like, hey, how's it going? Let's talk about this. The minute it records, I'm getting attacked. Well, like, we, I was getting attacked before the camera gotcha was on. Gotcha journalism. My own project was getting attacked <laughs> I'm getting before. Fucking- I'm fucking, uh, but that is a good segue. I am raising money uh, for and a I'm, movie. And I'm volunteering to raise money for his stupid fucking movie that I'm not even in, by the way. Well, I, you, you, it's an old guy with dementia. Can you play that? I'm almost that. <laughs> One more hang with you. What's it about Biden? Uh, it's uh, it's called Memory Room. It's a thriller. You don't know. Any, do you know anything about it? No. I mean, I'm, I, I'm just raising money. I should get associate <laughs> producer. Um, yeah, we'll put you in there. You'll get a special thanks. My um, cup broke. So it's called Memory Room. It's a thriller about. It's, it's, we wrote it as a feature. Now we're making it as a, as a film, a, a twenty minute film. It's about a caretaker. A short film. It's called short film. Yeah, a caretaker who thinks her uh, patient with dementia may have committed a murder in the past. Oh, fun, Hitchcock. Hitchcock. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, nice. Why was that just like a thriller, or did Hitchcock do that? He had that movie. <laughs> what was the Hitchcock? What movie? It was called Diddy or Didn't He? <laughs> Nineteen sixty one. <laughs> 
<laughs> did he or didn't he? 1961, United Artists. <laughs> You never saw that? I, I missed that one. Yes, Grace <laughs> Kelly and, uh, and Hugh Grant. <laughs> but so we're raising money. But here's the thing. The Kickstarter is, we'll get to the movie. The Kickstarter is only, this comes out Wednesday. It's closed like This comes Thursday. out Wednesday? Or no, what's today? Tuesday? I have no idea. This is going to come out tomorrow. Oh, you're going to do this by tomorrow? Yeah. Alone? <laughs> well, no, no, no. I'm sending it to Lex. He's going to uh, do that part. He's going to do post. But so, um, so it's coming out tomorrow, but I think it's only like a day left. So donate now. MemoryRoomMovie.com. Go to MemoryRoomMovie.com. Turn this off. You don't have to watch it anymore. Go there now. There's a lot of cool rewards when you donate. A limited edition Ron on Hirschberg t-shirt. Whoa. Uh, you could get a producer's credit if you donate $3,000. Uh, but, uh, you know, which we have a couple of people donating that. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't believe that. I realize I could raise a million dollars. Between oh, yeah. you and a few other people and uh, that I've worked with. Raising money on my back oh, you of me totally. signing things. But you might be doing so well, people might get mad that you're raising money. People get mad no matter That's what true. That, I do. I it's was, crazy. Well, let's think about this. Every celebrity at some is hated by at least half the people now at this point. Right. You're, no matter what you do in life, the tension is so high, you're going to be just hated by half the people. Well, you and I were talking about this off camera right before. I am shocked and just blown away how many people... Watch a comedian on a comedy show and take everything dead serious. Yeah. I got a guy mad at me because I was like, I flew first class to L.A. with my baby. And I was like, if you don't fly first class with your baby, you're an idiot. <laughs> and people are like, this is a little short sighted. I think most people I'm like, it's a bit, you fucking ma maniac. Are they, yeah, I don't I don't know. It's 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 yeah, it's 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 insane. People don't get jokes or people and people just so. Like, there's no way to escape it. I, right, not to get into intro, we're not going to get into that, but I saw, there was a picture. Someone we got put, into it, but, but the podcast was still going on. Adam Sandler is like one of the least offensive, like likable, I know you're, you know, he's a likable guy. Yeah, I know him. Beloved, buddies. beloved. I literally, somebody posted a picture of him or something, and one of the comments was like, get this genocidal giraffe off my screen. So it's like, there's no escaping. You're going to get hated no matter what. It's, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's wild. Um, yeah, don't, but anyway. don't, don't lead me down there. <laughs> I'm not leading you down. Um, but anyway, memorymovie.com. Let's work on the movie, too. I'm, I can work on your Let movie. Let's work on it. Yeah, let's work on it. I'm free. You're the one. I know you're free. Have a Believe kid. me. I haven't seen you in like a year. I know. Well, First I'm time busy. I see you was last night. I, I, you and Rosebud make me feel like I, I have no meaning in my life because I don't have a fucking kid. Well, let me talk about this for a second because this is serious. And I want to talk to you. And I'm going to get a little Ron on yeah. I'm going I'm to show you what it's like to be with you. What do you need, your phone? Where's my water? Your water? Oh, it's over there. That's all right. Just go get it. They don't need to see you. <laughs> Stay over there for about a half hour. Right. Still looks good? Yeah. Okay, great. Now you have a yeah, I think right. so. I right. believe me, they can hear you. <laughs> Even if this thing was broken, they can hear you. But you have a thing. This is what you do. Like I'll talk about how I'm insecure, and then you're like, that's because you didn't go to college, so you're insecure yeah, about your yeah. IQ. You know how you do that? I'm gonna do this for you. Because yesterday, all of a sudden, you just went. First of all, I'm talking to Rosebud. You're just eavesdropping. <laughs> I'm not eavesdropping. I'm sitting there. You're not including me. I'm only eavesdropping because you're not including. But we me. weren't sitting in a circle. We were sitting <laughs> three in a row. We were talking like this. It no wasn't a else. triangle. No triangle. You were over here. I'm sorry that I assumed the minute I sit down, it creates a triangle, not a. <laughs> well, it's three points as a triangle, I guess. But it wasn't a. It was an. Uh... I'm only eavesdropping because you're not acknowledging my existence. <laughs> no, we. You and I had been talking before, yeah. and then and Rosebud then you started and Rosebud talking, baby. The... So when the, we started. But by the way, half the conversations I'm in with you, you start looking at your phone right when I'm making a point. So now this one, all of a sudden, you're you listening. You started a conversation about Rosebud about how no one can understand life at all without a kid. No, this is my point. That's not what we were saying at all. Okay. And then all of a sudden, you go, oh, yeah, the Dalai Lama has no wisdom because he doesn't have kids. We never even mentioned wisdom. So you have, you have a struggle. You struggle with feeling meaningless in your life. Well, we all do. Yes, but you struggle so much that two people talking about how much they love their kids makes you go, oh, I have no wisdom. I don't have any wisdom. Dalai Lama has no wisdom. I'm like, well, we're not even I'll, talking I'll about wisdom. I'll be honest. You're right. I felt a little thing because you were talking to Rosebud about how you never felt love like you felt love for your child. Yes. And all I wanted to say to you was, have you seen the movie The Thing recently? And the question felt trivial in relation to what you were talking I about. I love the thing. <laughs> but I have I, a McCready I, action figure upstairs. But I felt, we I felt weird. I felt like, oh, I'm just like, 
you're all talking like once you have a kid, you've never understood love. And I'm just like, man, the thing. Have you watched it recently? It really, it's really quite great. And I just feel like an asshole. I feel like is my life that meaningless? Yes, but. Mine is too. Yeah, you just was a kid. Doesn't mean there's no, there's still no meaning. But we weren't making this point. We weren't making this argument. Well, Rosebud said something. She said something. I'm mean. sure she said something. <laughs> but there are things that you feel when, once you have a kid. I was talking to Matt McCusker about this. Uh-huh. When you get delayed, like I used to be like he stressed about. He, he has two he, kids. Okay, so he has. A, so twice I used to be. Much yeah, so I used to be stressed about flying. I'm like, shit. I got a 6 a.m. tomorrow from JFK to LAX. That's a yeah, long yeah. flight. Oh my god. It's I, I got to get up at four. If I leave at four, the traffic. And then you do it with a baby and you're like that's hilarious that right, I was right. worried about that before and then he made the point where I was like you know your flight gets delayed he's like what alone so what you have to read a book for six hours right. everything gets heightened when you have a baby because you're like now we have to entertain this baby we're gonna run out of formula yada yada it, it becomes this domino effect where it's like you don't have a kid and then someone has a kid and they're like man you think you had problems but then someone has two kids and he's like you think you have problems with one kid? Imagine having two kids. It never ends. Every kid, you're like, that's nothing. Well, <laughs> of course. I one mean, baby with a delay? That's nothing. So you hold the one baby. I got four kids. I'm juggling in the terminal. That's nothing compared to it. Of course. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's everything. Well, it never ends. It's like, it's, like, it's like a ladder of... Uh... But don't you see? That's a wonderful way to get perspective in life. Because you could be... You know, I'm sitting here going, oh, man, I have two spots. I don't know how I'm going to make it. And then I turn on the news... And there's, uh, you know, a bomb went off and my sister's asshole and this person has no yeah. fingers and no money. So it does give you perspective. Yeah, I guess so. The, no, I'm not one of those guys who like when I, there's like horrible suffering and shit. That doesn't make me feel, that just makes you feel guilty. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I don't feel like some people are like, I have so much gratitude. Every time I think of a kid with AIDS in Africa, I just feel so great about my life. The AIDS corroding his body really makes me just love my life. And I, I just feel like an asshole. I just feel, I don't feel gratitude for my life. I'm like, ah, this is, I just feel depressed for everyone. But at some point you'll go to the doctor and they'll be like, you're going to die in six months. Six? Really? Uh, maybe. Well, six maybe three months. months. <laughs> Why is it always six? <laughs> it's always know. six. No, sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's a year. Weeks. They give me a year to live. That's crazy, weeks. <laughs> a guy, they give me a year to live, yeah. Yeah, a year. Or you get hit by a bus and yada, yada, boobly boop. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, you have plenty of meeting and you're doing, you're doing great. A doctor could really make your life. I mean, this is like a scene from Fight Club. Uh, can we talk about movies on this podcast? Is that okay? I yeah. Don't ruin well, if you have the other movie <laughs> podcast now. But uh, if a doctor went like sat you down and was like, "You have one week to live," and then I was like, "I'm just kidding. I just want you to feel gratitude for your life." That would actually be quite amazing. You might not trust that doctor again, but that would like you know. Well, I was just telling a story like this recently on Tuesdays with Stories, this other podcast I do. Uh-huh. And, uh, I'm doing Mondays with uh, Journeys. <laughs> <laughs> Mondays with Journeys. <laughs> um, but I, I went to, I, I had a flat tire and I went to the gas station. I'll tell you quick because some yeah, people yeah. might have heard it. But I, I said, I have a flat tire. And the guy goes, well, look at it. He looks at the tire. He goes, it needs to be replaced. So there's the other tire and you need an alignment. It's going to be $480. And I went, fuck, okay, well, I just want to get there safe. I want to be safe. Yeah, I have yeah. a family. 480 and then 20 full minutes passed and he called me over and he goes we were looking at totally the wrong car oh. he's like your tire is totally fixable and it'll cost 26, 26 bucks you think he was lying to make you feel better you think he's like he no I think like- he's a fuck up idiot, <laughs> idiot. but I say $475 but it is I will say this it's not a great thing to say about life the fact that we can only have gratitude by reminding us how much shittier it could get like well you could is, have gratitude without that <laughs> yeah. this is just an exercise to help but I, I do think like that is a, uh, a reveal of how shitty life is that like to really get perspective you just have to be like well the suffering's bad but it could be a lot worse you it's know? not how shitty life is it's how shitty our mindsets are Good it's point. how it's it's our hedonic adaptation hedonic adaptation it's because we that's adapt right. to all these the things that's what it is life is actually wonderful and tremendous but we keep moving the goalposts on ourselves. That's right. That's a good point. I can remember distinctly saying to Mark Norman when we do the podcast, I was like, if we could make $1,000 a month each, that would be unbelievable. <laughs> that would be incredible with the podcast. And now we make, you know, twice that. <laughs> And, Twice. Um, You're trying to sound like the everyman here. Huh? And, uh, and I'm like, now I'm like, fuck, why can't I make that Tim Dillon money? I want to yeah. make that Shane Gillis money. Yeah, of course. It never it never ends, you know. But I mean, you know, I actually think people make, like, you attack me. You're like, yeah, you're never grateful. I actually do think I'm. I didn't attack you. <laughs> well, people, no attack. No, you, a lot of times you're like, you're always complaining. But I actually think I am. Well, you are always complaining. But there's a contentment with me. Most of your, and, and we, you we don't have think this, of me as content? 
I think that you enjoy film and you enjoy hanging out and conversing and, and discussing. But I also enjoy like artistic. I have some self fulfillment in artistic stuff as opposed to like. Uh, just you seem to always hate comedy <laughs> and you didn't want to be a comedy. We talked about this. You didn't want to be. When we talked about Rocky. You didn't want to be a comedian. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Uh, movie. So we've done two movie references in about 20 minutes. That's all right. It's Joe and Ronnie talk. That's what, <laughs> that's that's what I is. wanted to call the podcast anyway. So we're not critiquing these films, which, by the way, I got to tell you this story. Yeah. So we talked about uh, Batman and Iron Claw. Did we talk about Iron Claw? Uh, we talked about it walking somewhere. Once. Yeah. You hated it, right? Yeah, you did too, right? No. No, I, you liked it. I, I liked couldn't believe it, yeah. that. And Monus liked it too. I was. I was. Uh, I thought it was really good. I didn't know the story. I mean, I, I didn't know the story. I was just like, I was just uh, riveted. But surely the last 10 minutes you thought were insane. I when they do the jump, when he has his foot and he's jumping, that was insane. That was and bad. And the dream sequence thing That is dream insane. sequence was bad. Very bad. And, and then the kids being like, we'll be your brothers. That's that, one of the worst things I've ever seen. That was upsetting because that actually was it had all the material for a good scene, but it was like over explained. Yeah. But it could have actually been here's the thing though. It's still powerful just as a story outside of its artistic choices. The story itself is just powerful at the end and you do feel really bad for him. Mm -hmm. I do think like if he just watched his kids playing and he played with them, that it, that idea you know, oh, he's his brothers now could just be. That's the whole point of movies. You put the idea in the audience's head. You don't fucking say it. You right. know what I mean, that's the whole point. You let the visual make you think, oh, he's going to be his brothers now. So they did ruin that. Much like the you know the classic Shawshank moment where it's this incredible moment where we're all listening to opera and they're liberated, and then you immediately hear Morgan Freeman go, "I had no idea what those ladies were saying, but I imagine it was too beautiful to be put into words." Yeah, and it's like what the, the fuck? But, then stop talking. But he's narrating. <laughs> I know, but like that scene would have been so much more powerful without that. You okay, don't want that's the narration. A bad example. That it's make not sense. a bad example. You don't want the narration to tell you how to feel. That would have been a much better moment. He's without telling narration. you how he feels, but you dummy. Could, you he's could not saying, it. "Hey guys at home." No, but I'm. But it's. It's. It would have. You could have a shot of him. But it, the whole it, movie is him explained. narrating it. Well, it's. But you could pull it back a little. Pull it back. You don't have to explain that moment. That would have been a great, quiet, beautiful moment of them all just listening. Okay, but the the format of the film is him telling the story. We haven't argued in a while. This yeah, the, the <laughs> format of the film is him telling the story, and in the storytelling. You wouldn't actually be able to hear the music, so it's him telling the story, and you're getting the visual. I know, but like, well, but that, but you're talking about Shawshank. This is Iron Claw. This I, it's is not the a same classic. Mistake. It's, it's 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 overly explaining what would have been a powerful scene without it. It's but the that same mistake shot of him growing his foot back and jumping up and down, a tight shot of his feet jumping, is one of the worst <laughs> shots and and decisions in the history of film. But anyways, the point is, we also talked about the Batman, and that my whole point Batman. is Batman. What are you talking about? Didn't we talk about that movie at one point? The, the new Batman movie? From like 10 years ago? Which Batman? What are you talking about? Isn't it called The Batman? From like a year ago? Yes. But what about it? I'm about to tell you. <laughs> You're interrupting. <laughs> Sorry. I'm about to. I'm, I'm leading into the story. So and the story is I worked. I did Shane Gillis's show. I opened for Shane at the Greek Theater. Oh, wow. Who's there? But Zach Efron and Robert Pattinson. Whoa, and I'm crazy. on here going, Batman's gay and <laughs> Iron Claw sucks. And now here are these two men. And, I, and Adam Sandler I've, I've hung out with. I, I can't do the podcast. Oh, you're telling me? I fucking hung out with Quentin Tarantino. I, I had know. to fucking, he's like, how many how many episodes? Which episode is it? It's called Tarantino's Overrated. I had to just fucking like, be like, yeah, you know, it's deep down, don't watch it. You know what I mean? I saw the guy. By the way, he never watched my film, I think, because you. Because of me? What do you mean? Because the... you told him about our podcast, then he watched us, and he saw me being like, I don't know, Reservoir Dogs suck. <laughs> Although I love every Tarantino film. You know I love every QT. Yeah. Except yeah, for that yeah. fucking Death Drive, whatever the fuck, that piece death of trap, shit. Death Trap, Death Drive, Death... <laughs> um, <laughs> death... Death car, <laughs> what is it? Death mobile. Have I told Death my squad? theory about that though? What is that movie called? Death, death. car, Death Smash, Drive car, Drive Smash, Drive... Bad Driver... It's Bad Driver. It's Baby Bad Driver. I hate Baby Driver, by the way. Have I told you my theory about Death Cab? What is it called? <laughs> it's called we don't Death, have Lex. Death, Lex. Proof. Death, Death Proof. Death Proof. Fucking Lex, Death you proof. fucking piece of shit. You should be right there Death, looking it up for us. Death Cab for cutie. <laughs> <laughs> but have I told you my theory about that? I have a great theory about Oh, that. I bet it is. I, I love that you preface with it's great theory. I'm telling you, this is big. I can't wait to hear it. So. Hold on, I didn't take my phone off, uh, whatever. Uh, whatever. Well, you can't. You have a kid now. You got to always be 
open. You get text. You know, the baby's going to call. All right. Tell me the big grand theory about death ass. So before death cab for boobies, they had, they had a <laughs> death cab for boobies. He did kill bill volume one, right? Yes. I think both of them. He filmed both, both of them. Yeah, they came yeah. out a few months apart. So in Kill Bill, they had him and Uma Thurman had a momentarily fall, falling out because he had her drive really fast and doing right. her own stunt, and she really hurt her neck. Right. And so she really hated him, like was really angry that he put her in this position. Right. So Death Cab for Cutie <laughs> is actually his kind of like apology <laughs> because the guy is a stunt car driver. And he ends up getting attacked by all these women. Right. And he also represents kind of the director in the movie because he's like this this kind of angry, controlling guy. Right. And the women have their revenge on him. So to me, that's just like personal movie. Oh, that's interesting. That's actually his most personal movie because it's about him in a way like letting himself get revenged. Right. Avenge for what he did. Yeah, interesting. Kurt Russell is him. And has the most feet. Most feet, which is the most personal. You want to hear another? I have two good Tarantino theories. Is this one the thing? Yeah. Have I told you this? Yeah. Well, have I told them? No, you haven't told me. I haven't told them. I don't think. I actually haven't heard this. But like, okay, so Tarantino said that when he made Reservoir Dogs, it was kind of like him wanting to do his version of the thing. All these yes. men locked in a place. They don't trust each other. But the real movie, The Thing, is Hateful Eight. Right. Hateful Eight is the thing. Hateful Eight Stars Kurt Russell. Yes. Is scored by uh, Morricone, the guy who scored the thing. Yes. Is in the snow. Yes. And it's all these people locked in a cabin, not trusting each other. In the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere. And it ends with the white guy and the black guy there alone together. Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell and the black guy. And they don't trust each other. And they don't trust each other. Hateful Eight is the thing. Yes. Has anyone said this? Is, is this obvious? I don't I'm know. I'm sure, because I brought it up to a couple people, and they were like, yeah. Oh, maybe it's obvious. I don't know. Yeah, so that's me anyway. But yeah, no, he likes to uh, to do that. And you know what's weird? Have we talked about this, too? In Election, one of our favorite movies, yes. we have to talk about it. Every time, yeah. Yeah, Election or Sideways or both. Leftover Stinks. I feel like he's just like... Holdovers. Kill Bill... Is that what it's called? Yeah, let's start with that TV show. Oh. Yeah. Well, maybe I like the movie now. It's a better title. But I feel like there's two in... I feel like Kill Bill Volume 2 has allusions to election. He uses the same music at one point, and then the car scene looks identical. Really? When Broderick is fantasizing, when he's in the red car on the way to the date yeah, with the neighbor, it's like the same exact shot as her driving. Mm. I'm like, is he using election? That's such a weird reference. It, I, do, it does feel weird, but I think the music, th th there's a song that's like the same too. Interesting. It may be. I mean, I mean, I mean I, he takes a hodgepodge, but it's I, hard to imagine him just being like, I love election. I think directors are always just ripping off every, like, just different movies. Well, steal like an artist. That's yeah. all art. I mean, what are we doing that's different than fucking David Brenner did in 1948? Oh, you mean stand up? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah. Even that, I mean, this is Siskel and Ebert. I mean, like, it's all it's all pipes. I mean, the, the Beatles just stole from the black people and all that shit. This is Siskel and Ebert. I'm going to die. You're going to die first. That's true. And I'm going to have my mouth be uh, ripped off. Removed. Have yeah, I ever told I you about so. Ebert bit? No, I don't think so. So I, I never I never done stage because no one get it. But like, so Ebert had cancer and he had they had to remove a piece of his mouth. Yeah. And they gave him a prosthetic mouth. But then he could talk. He typed and it would talk. But they used audio. They created his voice by using all the audio from the Siskel and Ebert show. Did you know no, that? No. I didn't so know. I just I thought it was a funny bit. Like anytime you talk, you're like, "How's the uh, How's your meal, Roger?" Two thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> a marvelous <Yeah>. experience. <laughs> like, he can only talk in those Ebert reviews. Right. <laughs> but, but why would his voice sound like a robot? Well, it's a robotic voice. Oh, wait, right. Well, it's but like... they took his TV voice. Yeah, but it's still like a little robotic. Because it's yeah. like, you've okay. seen it, right? He's like half a puppet. I did, I guess. But I just thought it would sound like Roger Ebert. It's Roger Ebert, but like a little robotic. Okay. You know? You well, know? I'll work on the impression. But I like it. <laughs> Overall, I like it's it. It's a good bit. It's a good bit. It's a good bit in the 80s and it's still relatable today. <laughs> Um, how about that Francis Ford Coppola trailer? You see I, that? I, I gotta say, I I have such a bittersweet feeling about that. On one hand, I'm like, it's so beautiful. It looks beautiful. It's so beautiful that he that he spent that he took his generations of his family's future wealth <laughs> into this movie. I think they're doing okay. Yeah, it's like Nick Cage, Sofia Coppola, Roman Coppola. That's true. That's a good point. But I mean, this got to be the most anyone has self funded a movie, right? 
Well, he did it with Apocalypse Now too. This is what he does. He's a he's a he's a rambler and a gambler. He throws all the money. I mean, you watch the documentary, right? Yeah, yeah. So he so that's mostly well, there was some studio money, right? Obviously in the beginning. Apocalypse Now. Yeah. But I think he yeah, he put down his own money but to get brand. I'm pretty sure this is just completely self funded, right? Is it? He said he spent uh, sold part of his wine shit. Right. $150 million he put into this movie, which is insane. Well, he's 85. He's 85, but like, I, I don't, I mean, yeah. I On one hand, I, A, I mean, I think it's beautiful. I have bittersweet feelings. On one hand, it's like sad that the industry just does not fuck with people anymore. Like, right. I mean, I guess he did make 25 mediocre movies like all in a row but like when you look at his rotten tomatoes scores it's not pretty it's a lot of in the 30s it's like 31 it's, 17 do you know he directed jack with robin yeah, williams i do know that it, it's really scary he like he's a scary concept of that just talent just somehow like floats away abruptly but out i of think nowhere. like what if tomorrow you woke chances. up and just couldn't, it weren't funny uh i don't know but that's probably more likely for you but uh, <laughs> he takes chances i think I mean, Rumblefish doesn't make any sense. It's yeah. wacky. And then he has these movies like the last one. There was one I hadn't even heard. Of. It's got like 12% on Rotten Tomatoes. Right. But he, he also like he takes chances. But he also it's weird. It's also like weirdly his early career is so ambitious. But then he's like weirdly mediocre, almost like a hack for hire, like Jack or the Rainmaker, just as like John Grisham movie. Even Dracula, I couldn't it's understand. It's just like a lack of ambition or something in a weird way. I don't know. It's like, but but it, it feels like he just lost something. But so it's cool that he's making this. It's cool that he's self-funding it. But at the same time, I'm like, I hope it's good. <laughs> I hope so too. Well, what's crazy too is like he's such a genius. Like he's my favorite person, and I don't just mean directors. Like my favorite person of any kind to listen to. Yeah, yeah. He, he taught. We saw him live at at the uh, at the Beacon. Louis and I. He presented uh, Apocalypse Now, and it was like so meaningful and beautiful. Like he's the most thoughtful guy. And I just love listening to him talk. He talks about his grandfather, or food, or olive oil, right, or the future right. of filmmaking. He's so. Um, incredible wise whatever i mean you can tell he has kids because he's got a lot of wisdom and <laughs> he's just brilliant but then these movies i want so much and the godfather and godfather two are the most important movies to me they're my favorite movies ever and i also love apocalypse now the conversation apocalypse i never sucks. got as much into that sucks but apocalypse now is overrated once you watch apocalypse now redux you're like it like really makes you lose respect for a lot of the movie. Well, Redux is not as good. The French scene I really hate. It's I awful. It's like pretentious. It. It's and, but bad. It's also like there's like I know, I'm not obviously Apocalypse Now is really good, but there's some bad like just kind of like catch twenty two like humor in it that's just bad. Like for example, the surfing and shit, and then like all that shit is just I don't know. I find that like. Just not that. It's like trying to be funny. I don't know. I find it weird. And then the Redux, you see like. Martin Sheen trying to be funny a lot in it, and it's really awkward. Like, he's, like, trying to leave Duvall, and Duvall's chasing him. It's, like, a lot of bad, like, comedy. It's a it's a mess, but the original version the I still, still love and is great. And, and, and you love metaphors and allegories. It's an allegory for him and a I journey. I love a lot of the it. There's, I mean, some, like, there's a lot I don't love. There's a lot where I'm just thinking, like, it's actually, like, fairly, like, simplistic, like, symbolism. And then also, like... I do think the ending doesn't really work. I think I think he tricked people's Branda just improvising a bunch of nonsense. Right. But I don't think it's effective. I don't think they really get into like they get into Brando saying these pretentious things about how horrible war is, but they don't make you understand the godlike violent impulses he has. They yeah. they seem completely disconnected. He's just like, war is horrible. And then he's just cutting off heads. Yeah, and it could be <laughs> scarier. I think there's a place yeah. for like more horror. It could have turned into a real he horror. Should like be he the rolls horror. the head yeah. and it's like, ah! but then like, he but then the next day he's like, I saw a girl's arm get cut off. It was terrible. It's like it doesn't make sense. They should you can't have the hippy dippy improvised stuff about the horrors of war and the I'm a god. You don't see the I'm a god part, really. Right, right. It, it's like an after, it doesn't work. It doesn't connect. Well, and then when you see the documentary, which is better than yeah. the film, literally, it's a better film, in my opinion, but you see that like he's literally just improvising. When he, and the, yeah. the moment where he's like, I can't think of anything else to say today no, is amazing. And actually, that moment, like, really... It almost hurts the movie. The documentary right. kind of hurts the movie. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, because it's like, oh, he's just, they're just, this whole journey 
is just dependent on Marlon Brando trying to improvise his way into an ending. Yeah, he got fucked. He got fucked. He got he, fucked by hiring Skinner's the wrong better. guy. Skinner's better. Skinner's more cult-like, godlike, fat. When you're eating that, I don't know. It, and it's like, and then when he's like, yeah, there's one shot in the documentary. The documentary really kind of does, like, I, like make like it, like the well, one part where he's just like gain respect and yeah. lose respect at the same time because Brando's like he's just like what horror a bug just fell into my mouth like it's just right, like right. it's just so bizarre you know um, I'll tell you what movie I think we talked about it before but I want to talk about it again because I rewatched and I love it so much and I think is underrated and maybe my favorite fucking war movie Full Metal Jacket. People hate the second half of this movie. I think the second half is great. I understand there's not as much plot and it feels more like vignettes, but I still love it. I'll be honest. I think Full Metal Jacket, to me, is way more effective than Apocalypse Now. Of course. I think Apocalypse Now is so heavy on the imagery that you end up having no real sense of like, it's just the same idea over and over again, the craziness. But with Full Metal Jacket, you see actual like deliberate conditioning, so you see more ideas. There's not really that many ideas in Apocalypse Now. It's just kind of like absurd kind of imagery. I guess they're trying to create the idea of craziness. But Full Metal Jacket, it's like kind of an interesting. I mean, you know, it's a little, it's a little top heavy. Um, the first half is certainly yeah, yeah. better than the second half. But you do see something you don't see. Like you do see this amazing conditioning you know what i mean that is pretty incredible yeah and i love i still love the second half people everyone hates it but i do love first of all i love the format of that movie which i tried to make fourth of july i wanted to be a similar format where it's just two halves and they're just they they look nothing alike they're very right, dissimilar right, right, right. and i love that format and i love the matthew modine character is really great because he's so I guess I relate to the character. He's so courageous yeah, yeah. in the first half with standing up to uh, Sergeant Bilko, or whatever the fuck his name is. And, uh, you know, he's he's ignorant and he's silly, but he's got guts and guts is enough. But then when it gets down to the actual, when he's in the shit and in the battle, he, he freaks out. I mean, like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. and you realize it's like, as no matter what you go through in boot camp and what you see, he saw a yeah. friend shoot himself. Once you're in that moment, in that fucking battle, there is no prepping for that. Right. Well, he also, he has, he, he, he takes part in the fraggle rocking, whatever the fuck it's called. The fracking. Yeah, yeah. Fraggle, well, that part fra too. <laughs> what is it called? Why are you calling it fraggle rock? Fragging, frag, flog, flogging. Fracking? It's like a term for it. Lax, goddamn, fragging, flogging. Fra there's a term for when you put the thing in the, the soap and the thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, whatever. But you can see fraggle him. Fraggle rock. Tortured in that thing, too. Yeah. And, the, and then he has the most anger. He hits him the most times. And D'Onofrio is fucking great. Oh, I just watched The Player last night and this morning. D'Onofrio is amazing. Oh, yeah. yeah Underrated yeah. actor. D'Onofrio is great. The Player fucking rules well, that I, movie. You know, I mean, I, 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 one of the things we should, we're all over the place, but one of the things we should bring up in this episode is that I have had kind of a bit of a, a 180 on Kubrick. Oh, you love him now. You used I, to hate him. I used to like be annoyed by The Shining. I think The Shining is like so brilliant. What? You're an <laughs> asshole. You really are a fucking awful asshole. What? You literally talked about, we have a full episode where you talk about how stupid The Shining is. It sucks. It's not good. It's a bag of shit. It's, there's all these like, Kubrick has this weird thing where you have to watch his movies a bunch of times to really fully get it. But like. Fully metal jacket. I get like. I don't know. It's like, yeah, for years I'm like, yeah, Jack Nichols is crazy right away, and he's not really scary. And I guess I still kind of feel that on some level. But the the way the movie uses deliberately at times, not always, but deliberately uses continuity errors to fuck with your head, mm -hmm. it is like he's working on another like dimension kind of. You know what I mean? Right. And the tone of the movie is, I guess I've accepted the fact that like, I don't know. I got kind of obsessed with that movie. I, I'm yeah. getting really into horror because I'm trying to write a horror screenplay. I heard, yeah. Um, me too. About my Alone. <laughs> I'm writing a horror screenplay about my podcast co-host leaving me. And uh, but uh, it's so I've been getting but like shining. I, I take I take it all back on Kubrick. He's the best. Have you watched yet House of the Devil? You know, I tried to watch it the other day and then I, I fell asleep. It looked what good. I just tried to. I, 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 I take it at night, I take a sleeping pill, I fall asleep. It's not the movie's fault. Um, but I uh, get it. I'm like, you never take my Rex. I'm like, you gotta watch I'm, I'm this. I'm taking it. I'm excited to watch it. It's like the bet you've been watching horrors for six months, and uh, we talked about it. Follows. That's one of the best movies of all time. That, 
I love It Follows. Have it we follows. talked about it? We haven't talked about it on the pod, right? I don't think so. I so I I went through a whole this is kind of I don't want to get too much into Ron on Talks horror movies. You know, I don't want to be ripping off that episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's outrageous. It's one of the craziest things I've ever seen. I was hurt. Literally hurt. You were hurt? Yes, feelings hurt. I just posted like a thing. I don't know. I, I, yeah, you posted a podcast called Ron on Talks Movies <laughs> with this other guy. Horror movies. Horror okay, movies. Okay, yeah, fine. I didn't say talks movies. I said talks I'm going to do Tuesdays movies. with Tales with <laughs> Sam Morrill. <laughs> I'm doing Tuesdays with Worries. It's a whole anxious podcast. Nice. <laughs> um, but so it follows. Watching that again was... That is one of the greatest horror movies. It's a it's time. a it's a masterful movie. I saw it uh, at Universal Studios, that movie theater in the Universal play by myself. Right before I was in the middle of the last comic stand, it must have been twenty fifteen. I went over there by myself, watched this. I was like, I'll watch this movie. Maybe I can watch it with Chris Walsh. Actually, I can't remember. But I went and saw it, and it just stuck it's with me. Beautiful. It's a beautiful film. I think people they're always saying STD, but that's like a simplification, in my opinion. To me, it's about the the the, the end of innocence, a sense of alienation and anxiety of growing up and aging mm-hmm. and that comes with maybe after you have sex and how transactional life can be. But to me, it's ma- way more about that than the STD fear. Because if you watch a, the, the scene with her in, um, in that first scene where she goes on the date, yeah, they're pointing out people who they're like, who would you be if you could pick someone to be? Right. And the guy who's already been having the it follows points to a little kid he goes i'd love to be a little kid having your whole life ahead of you right and that's really to me what the movie's about this loss of innocence because once you get infected by this it's never to me it's the greatest metaphor for anxiety and alienation to have the thing that's scaring you that no one else can see right it creates this complete aloneness you know what i mean and then in the last shot it goes back to the kids because you actually see her and that other dude, they're actually filing together. Right. More out of fear than like, you know, really. And they're holding hands and there's a guy behind them who might be following them. Right. But then it ends on these children laughter on the in the front lawn. Right. And it, so it is this end of like innocence. It's a brilliant, brilliant movie. No, I've said it before. That is the best movie about anxiety and panic yes, yes. that I've ever seen. It is incredible. It is the shots are such a work of art. There's one shot that is just so beautiful where it, do you remember the shot where they're going into the school and the camera does a 380 around the 380 in the yeah wait 380 oh no no 180 wait what's all 360 360 <laughs> i mean i guess you can do a 380 you do a 360 and then you go 20 degrees more <laughs> 360 it does a 360 um and it's you see a window where a woman's walking kind of but you don't know for sure if that's but when the camera pans back to that window, she's still walking forward in a way that reveals it. Yeah, yeah. And so, so it's revealed in the. It's just incredible. So many incredible shots. Yeah, and it's genuinely scary. Genuinely scary, and it's just like it's a purely. It's like a beautiful. The pool thing is a little weird. It's a little anticlimactic. Yeah, but it's a. It's a beautiful that going back into horror canon. The movies I really fell in love with were like, The Shining. It follows. Um, I wish you watched House of the Devil. I'm going to watch it. I'm excited. I, I know, saw, but it's so fucking good, and I, it's up there with those ones. I watched the opening. I saw Greta Gerwig being quirky. She's amazing. She's amazing And in so it? is the other woman. Yeah. Uh, it's great. No, no. It looks, it looks awesome. I'm excited. Tom Noonan, right? How far did you get in? I just fell asleep. I'm going to watch it. I, how I got, far? 15 minutes. It's not... I, I was just... Ty West is the fucking man. I yeah, love that guy. No, he's great. I, I, I really think, like... Yeah, those are the ones that really... And R- Rosemary's Baby, which I think is like the greatest movie ever. Yeah, you love Rosemary's Baby. I love Rosemary's Baby. Right. But how crazy... We probably talked about this on the yeah. podcast, that the plot of that movie, this old lady dies on the sidewalk, Yeah, where just 12 years later, John, John Lennon would be shot and killed right in the same spot. Is it the same spot? Yes. It's the same spot? It's right in front of the door, Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's 10 feet away or whatever, <laughs> but it's the same spot. It's in front of the door. The door. Wow. Well, people Isn't think that, that crazy. Well, people think that movie, whole movie is haunted because it's like, yeah, you got the Polanski shit and, uh, you know, the oh, COVID right. of witches. I don't know. Like it's a little Manson The know? director of Rosemary's Baby is right there. <laughs> Wait, what is that? What's part time in Hollywood? Oh, He's yeah. living right next to it. the hottest director in town. But you know what's really creepy? If you Rosemary's Baby, you? Really, <laughs> Rosemary's Baby. Do you remember it pretty well? Or yes, what am I an asshole? <laughs> Rosemary's I Baby. Love Rosemary's Baby. Watching it uh, multiple times recently, there's all these crazy clues in it that I never realized. I think there's a reference to Rosemary's Baby at the end of the player. 
What's the, what is it? At the end of the player, which I just watched this morning, you know, he ends up in that Hollywood ending and he goes with the woman and he, she's yeah. pregnant and he puts his hand on her stomach and the music is like a kid singing like, la, da, Oh, really? La, da, da, la, la. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. it's a very similar music and I think it's it's got to be a direct I love Rosemary's player. Baby. I love, I love the, player. the player. I love Rosemary's Baby. But Two of the best movies ever. If, By the way, real quick. No, you missed Nashville. It played at the Paris what? yesterday, Sunday. God damn it. But, what? so you're telling me <laughs> you're going to watch Nashville and then the player, and then by the end of those two movies, you're going to go, Nashville's better? Oh, 100%. Get the fuck out of here. Pack up your shit and get out of here. That's insane. Well, well, I want to go back to Tim Robbins, Robbins but that's sucks. A- Tim Robbins sucks. The movie's good in spite of Tim Robbins. All the movies that Tim that are great with Tim Robbins, which no, there are he's many, good in that. He's, but he does that face where he's like, it's the same but, Shawshank but you face. Can't, you can't compare. I mean, player is good, but like Nashville. Steve Martin would have been better in the player. That's interesting. Nashville is like such a heartbreaking movie. Like the player isn't heartbreaking. No, it's hilarious and yeah, beautiful and Nashville spooky like, and thrilling. Uh, that's a crazy statement. Uh, Nashville is the best. But back to Rosemary's Baby. There are clues in that movie. It's a little like The Shining where you see like clues. There are clues in that movie that are I've watched a hundred times that I didn't realize. Tell me the clues. So... They kind of show you the story of what's happening because there's the story that you don't see, right? And they kind of show you it happened the whole time without you realizing it. So there's a part where after the the girl who's staying with the Cassavetes, the old couple, Mm -hmm. she dies, right? And Mia Farrow goes to sleep in her in her bedroom, and the wall to the bedroom you can kind of hear the couple from the other Mm. room. She goes to sleep and has this dream where there's a nun from her childhood yelling at her, and the nun is speaking in this voice that sounds familiar, but you, and I've never realized it till recently, the voice of the nun is Ruth Gordon, and what's happening is Ruth Gordon is having an argument on the other side of the room, and that argument oh, seeps is into seeping the into the dream, and the argument is her literally going after the girl got killed, I told you not to tell her. I told you she wouldn't have an open mind. It's her telling the husband, you shouldn't have told this girl that was staying with us our plot. We should have just done it without her knowing. Once we told her, she freaked out. That's why we had to kill her. And it's just this nun saying it. It literally seeps into the... Isn't that so creepy? That is creepy. It happens twice. There's another one, too, where like it's like she's dreaming, but it sleeps in. And then there's another part, because what's so... I actually think Rosemary's Baby might be the most bleak depressing like it's just never has someone been so alone in a movie and just every scene is just people lying to them right it is so just bleak but like the other thing is there's a part where Mia Farrow says she's about to go see Hutch you know the guy who uh the old guy Ed O'Neill movie (laughs) no that's Hitch her Dutch Dutch the the guy who like found out that the the one she used to live the landlord she used to have who's Uh friend and he he's kind of found out there's a plot Right. He's gonna tell her, and he's like, uh, he's like, he's gonna meet her the next day to tell her that there's this plot, and she tells John Cassavetti, she's like, I'm gonna go meet Hutch, and John's like, Oh yeah, when are you meeting her, him? And he's like, She's like 11 at Times Square, and he goes, Oh okay, hi, it's crazy. You're pregnant, but I have the munchies. I'm gonna get some ice cream. You want some ice cream? And she's like, Yeah, I'll get vanilla. He leaves, and if you listen closely, you can hear the doorbell ring. It's him going into the old couple's apartment to tell them that Hutch is on to. Oh, wow. And then in the next scene, like, Hutch doesn't make it. He's, like, in a coma. So there's all these, like, it's like it's like the story's always there the whole right, time. Right, right, right. It's so crazy to have. I've watched this movie so many times. Realizing the nun is speaking in her voice is such a crazy thing to realize after, like, ten viewings. Yeah, what are some other things like that in movies that you're like, oh, I didn't even get that? I mean, like, the thing in Reservoir Dogs, you always bring up the tip thing in the beginning. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like a big one. And there's an orange balloon. Did you know this about Jaws, your favorite movie of all time? That you see them crawling out of the water during the credits? Well, they're in the water, yeah. Oh, you see them going and- They come out and get safely on the land during the credits. (sighs) I had no idea. Isn't that one of them? I never got to the end of the credits. Like, it's in the credits, way in the distance, you see them come out of the water. Can I tell you- They safely arrive on land. This is really creepy, because- I want to tell you something that's like, so. Are you gay? <laughs> I've had this weird thing with Jaws, okay? So you don't I don't like Jaws now. No, no. You I, flipped it's, around it's the Jaws. Movie ever. I saw Jaws every day when I was five. We talked about that, right? Oh, my God. Have we ever? <laughs> 
But so I sometimes have this reoccurring dream where I'm watching Jaws, but I'm seeing scenes that aren't in the movie. And I've had this many times. And I have this weird feeling in the dream where I'm like, what? There are other scenes? And I think these dreams have to do with like the power of film with that when you make a movie, you cut out all these extra scenes, right? Of course. And, and then you just have the movie and you think of that movie as just that's its identity. Right. But then there's all these other moments. And so in the dream, which I've had many times, I'm watching different scenes of Jaws and feeling this weird like, oh, the thing that I thought was completely cemented isn't, you know what I mean? Right. The thing that I thought was a, a official movie has this kind of like fluidity. And then I saw on TV a YouTube thing that was showing deleted scenes from Jaws that apparently were shown on TV. And I started to watch it. And it was like my dream. I felt so freaked out. I like Whoa. I was freaked out watching these clips. What are some of the scenes? It's what like, are some of the scenes you've dreamed? The scenes I've dreamed is just like, uh, it's weird stuff. It's like a shark in the creek at one point. It's like him with his family at night talking about the what shark. What if it turns out you've never seen the movie? You're like, <laughs> the, the shark gets into the pond and it like, it knocks this guy off the boat. Yeah. And just his leg that. floats down. I'm like, wait, what? But so I, I've always, it's because I watch this movie so much at five. So watching at five every day cemented it into my head in the fear of something not being cemented, of it being fluid. I think that's what comes up in the dream. And then, like, you tell me that right now, the idea that there's footage at the end of that shot, which I've never seen, I've never gotten to the very end of the credits, is, like, so creepy to me. And this, I couldn't watch the YouTube thing the other day. I tried to start it. It was, like, it was like him having a different discussion with that kid in the beginning on the beach. They're talking about something else. I, I, I couldn't watch it. It's, like, it's about, to me, that, it's, like, the fear of death, the idea that, like, this thing that's full, complete can, like, Unravel. You well, know? I feel this way about delete. I always hated deleted scenes. Yes, and and alternate endings was my least favorite uh, thing. Well, alternate yes. endings is so frustrating because I'm like, but there's an end. You told a story. You can't give me an alternate ending. To, that is the ending. To me, a director's cut or an alternate ending is the greatest disservice a director could do to himself. I, I the completely agree. The greatest disservice. You made a work of art that is great because of its editing, because of the choices. To unwind that choice is to like. It's, it's it's crazy and, and and Coppola like Coppola has like ruined Apocalypse. The Apocalypse Redux has so many bad scenes. You're like, when you think of a movie being like flawless or something, you forget there was like other scenes that are like really bad in right, every right. movie. <laughs> and it took someone else to be like, you got to take that. Yeah, out. yeah, yeah, That's exactly. Crazy. In well, every that, movie, there's like Don Corleone giving a really bad line reading. <laughs> well, the, the French scene, which when Louis and I went and starred at the Beacon, we had we were both obviously overly familiar with the movie. And then like we kept saying like, I hope because it was like his final redux. This is yeah. his final, final thing that I think is out now. And uh I, I, we kept saying, like, I hope the French scene didn't make it. And then once they pull aboard and they're like, who are these people? We were both like, fuck. And it it really ruins the momentum because you're about to get yeah. to the fucking. What also makes you realize the movie's, like, pretentious and that it cut out a lot of pretentiousness. Right. Because that scene ends with that woman being like, what does she say? She's like, look at you. You have so much power, yet so much hate, or something. She's like talking to him like he's just, she's talking to like mankind in general or some shit. Yeah, it's not great. What about Fury? You like Fury? I've never seen it. The Brad Pitt movie? Yeah. This is what the podcast should be. Just us just rambling about movies. I right? love that. Yeah, that's what I've been saying for years, except not movies, other stuff. But Fury's <laughs> great. You should see Fury. Brad Pitt? I love that movie. I'll I think Brad it. Pitt might be my favorite actor of all time. Really? He's good. He's really fucking great. That's Brad Pitt performance. Uh I know you think Twelve Monkeys. No, me? Do I think... No, no, no. But that's your favorite movie of all time. It's one of my favorites. You think favorites, Bruce Willis is number one? Bruce I, Willis is in the player. He ain't in the fucking Nashville. I think Bruce Willis is way better performance in 12 Monkeys than Brad Pitt. I, think I know, but we're not talking about the best Monkey. performance in there. We're talking about that. I <laughs> no, mean... That's not my favorite. Uh, Brad Pitt, let me think. I mean, he's amazing in... Uh, what's the Western that's nine hours long? Jesse James. Jesse James, the, the killer of, of Bobby the Davis. Of the pussy who yeah. shot him in the face. <laughs> um... <laughs> Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is pretty fucking great. Be, right? I Once mean, he won the Academy Award, but he's great in that. I think he's great in 12 Monkeys. I think he's fun. Um, I think it's Once Upon a Time. Yeah, it's got to be. Worst performance, 12 Years a Slave, where he pops up and you're like... I hated that fucking movie. He's just... Certain actors can't be in period pieces. Brad Pitt... 
I guess he's been in actually a lot of period pieces. I think Brad Pitt's great in Moneyball also. He's great in that. But he is fucking You see what I'm saying? Brad Pitt can be in some... He can't be 1800s. No. It's like when Ethan Hawke shows up in The Northman. Certain actors, they just can't... Oh, I forgot about that they movie. They just can't... Certain actors are great, but they just can't... Like, Steve Buscemi can't be in the Roman Empire. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's just certain things... That like certain actors can't do. I, I was just talking, watching Fargo this morning because that's what I do. <laughs> I think Steve Buscemi uh, never been nominated for an Academy Award. I know it's crazy. That's appalling. I, he should have been nominated for Fargo. Yeah. Yeah, he's amazing. I feel like we have to wrap up soon because yeah. we got the other podcasts coming. But in. wait, there was something I was going to say. Real. Oh, when Frosted, you watch Unfrosted? I didn't. Did you? I watched the first ten minutes. I, I I really or twenty minutes. I realized I'm like, oh, this is a movie for kids. Everyone's like panning it, but I I'm know, like, oh, this is like, I think I was like, my niece would love this. And I talked to my buddy. He's like, oh yeah, she loved it. Let's talk a little, cause we've talked, but it is very annoying to see all these comics openly talk shit about him. About Seinfeld? Yeah. It's like, show it some makes fucking, me crazy. Res- show some fucking respect. I mean, like. It makes me fucking insane. He's, he's just like, he's, he's like, it's like, even if you think like hip, first of all, he, he was like, all he said was like, yeah, the left has made it hard for like TV shows to be made. And everyone's like, that's not true. What about this show from 58 years ago? Like, it's like no, I, I got into Twitter thing. I mean, I responded gr- to Michael Ian Black, which Luke Modis is like, you're the only person I've seen defend this man. And also just, and, and I've talked about Seinfeld a bunch. Like he's like family to me in yeah. that I'll shit on Jerry. You don't shit on exactly. Jerry. Fucking whoever this woman is and this other fucking person. And I'm like, the guy's one of the great comics of all time. He co-created and starred in the best sitcom ever. Yes. And he's a fucking legend. Can it, it, what makes me upset is- And he's right. That's what makes me yeah, so I mad. Know. It's like the dismissal of like, no way. And you're like, so you know more than Jerry Seinfeld, who is in the business and fucking has all these friends trying to make things. He's right. in it. Can, and, and like, I think what it reveals, and this is what really pisses me off, is certain like- Twitter comics now, these woke comics who just like complain and complain and complain. They have no sense of actually comedy as an art form. They only talk about it in terms of identity and politics, and they never talk about the tradition of comedy. And if you actually cared about the tradition of comedy, the evolution of comedy, you would realize Seinfeld plays a big influence in your comedy, in everyone's comedy. Of course. And I'm not saying don't talk shit about him privately. I mean, I do that all the time. But, like, don't, don't, well, he's like... he's very frustrating. He's but- frustrating at times. But, like, to publicly... First of all, the fact that everyone's ganging up on someone is always bad. Like, right. that's always, like, do you really want to be the guy ganging up? But, like... To like publicly talk shit about a guy who had such an influence on every comic, it just makes you. Sh- it just shows to me that these comics who care so much about identity and wokeness and 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 and, and being against like any like anti woke message, they don't give a shit about comedy as an art form. You know. Yeah, and it's just easy to shit. He's an old, rich, white guy. Yeah. He's out of touch. I'm like, well, how how is he out of more out of touch than you? He's in the fucking business. And then they name as these examples. They go, uh, well, always sunny in Philadelphia. FX came on 15 years ago. I know. Uh, what about Family Guy? Well, that's on. That's a cartoon. It started 22 years ago, and people are upset by it. Yeah. And then they're like, what about Curb, which he addresses in the fucking thing? It's grandfather. They just watched the clip, and it's like it was on HBO, and it's 25 years old. It's a hundred percent true there are no sitcoms anymore the only sitcom is like that black middle school or whatever it's like like it's like uh there are no you can't do that anymore unless your grandfather did well i got into it uh, not, not get into it but i just had to respond because and i try not to engage in any controversy but michael Ian black was like this doesn't make sense because he's so vanilla and he's never done anything that would upset anybody and i'm like seinfeld did an oral rape joke right and they also did a whole show where a guy commits suicide he jumps off a building and George is only upset because he ruined the roof of his car. Right, right. I'm like, try putting that on CBS right. at 8 o'clock p.m. It doesn't make sense. And, and, yeah. the, 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 uh, like, literally, <laughs> I mean, he does that. They did the Rhines are crossed. I yeah. mean, uh, they did the, the Puerto Rican Day Parade where they're stomping on the flag. I mean, literally, Jerry says he was under gas and he goes, I was spitting and rinsing like there was no tomorrow. And then Elaine dismisses it and goes, so what? You're single. <laughs> He's a victim of rape. And she's like, who cares? And what you're about single. that part where Elaine is like sleeping head to. Oh, yeah. That's so what? An- your genitals were still aligned. Yeah. There's another anal joke. That's anal, right? Yes. It's either course. anal or doggy style, but yes. I think it's anal. And it's just like crazy. The idea that like Jerry's never been edgy, which is also funny because they're all arguing. He's so vanilla and he's never been edgy. 
He literally got in trouble for comedians in cars because he had too many white legends right. on. Like, he's in trouble for that. Also, even if that wasn't true, all that, can't he just talk about the climate without referring to his own, like, maybe referring to other people as well? Like, maybe, like, even if, it, even if he doesn't create that stuff, which he does, even if he didn't, can he talk about other shows not being put right, on? Right, right. Like, yeah, Brian he, like, Regan can be upset yeah. about people getting, uh, that's like John that's, Denver, the big thing with the parental advisory, Tipper Gore, that thing back in the late 80s, 90s, what made such a difference about it was John Denver came in. Right. And, and spoke on behalf of the artists. Right. It's like... You're getting mad in your head. You think they don't do offensive shit. So you're essentially getting mad at him for speaking up about something that doesn't affect him personally, which would be a lack of selfishness. Which, by the way, that is their stance. They yeah. don't want white people to talk about police or violence or poverty either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, white people can't talk about anything. But like, it's like, it's. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> hey, I, I used to say Jew was like at least a little bit of a minority. Like, Jew is worse than white now. Oh, yeah. But yeah, anyway. Be that. But so, so it's just like. Yeah, it's it, it is true, and even if it is, it just shut the fuck up. Like it's like show some I, uh, show some respect for the tradition of comedy. I don't know, like the evolution of comedy. Well, like, these people that aren't real comics. They're That's not the real comics. They're not stand-up comedians. I mean, I you know I don't want to name names. We can name them off. But like the people with the viral tweets and tweeting about it, they're not in the comedy club. They have no reverence for it's actual the same people comedians. Who so openly dismiss Louis. One of the reasons a lot of people weren't so open to dismiss him it's because we recognize how big of an influence he is, he is on comedy right and the people are like he was never funny or like no no you just don't like comedy what you like is complaining and doing blogs and sharing fat girls like essays like that's what you like you don't like comedy well this other tweet the, the big viral one about jerry was like he hasn't been funny since the 80s i'm like even that even if you think he hasn't been funny in years i'm like well the 90s was when he was peak funny if you don't <laughs> yeah you brought this up if you post something where you don't think uh you don't realize that seinfeld was in the 90s it sounds like right then you sh you've lost your comedy badge Right. And um, yeah, also, watch I'm telling you for the last time, it's fucking hilarious. The Halloween bit, it's like one of the great just, bits of all time. It's, and I'm not, I don't, we're not trying to sound like curmudgeons here. It's just like, it's our love of comedy that is making us be like, what do you like? It's not even a political thing. It's just like, he is a big part of the evolution of comedy. And this, like, this, this fucking, like, tearing him down those people who tear down they have no respect for like the the evolution of it they think comedy started yesterday you know right it's no it's it's crazy and this um this lack of wanting to acknowledge any part of cancel culture yeah. or anything and it's it's all narrative and it's the same the, the right has very similar issues but the left it's just like no we won't take like it doesn't matter who says it what they say we are not the Nope, you can say anything on NBC anytime, yeah. it doesn't matter. And then they point to all these examples. Well, Shane Gillis is a bill yeah, on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> and, and fucking whatever, podcast. He did all no, yeah, not yeah. And no. he got on SNL and it was like a massive controversy. People were very upset. It's not to me, it's not a woke, anti woke thing. I actually think woke people who make their identity based on wokeness or anti wokeness are kind of annoying. To me, a love of comedy is somewhere in the middle beyond those two things. You know right. what I mean? Of course. And it's like that's the thing, like it's like I just wouldn't, yeah, I just think, like, you're just not caring about, like, the love of comedy when you openly talk shit and act like he was never funny or he sucks now. It's like, yeah, but he, he like, he is a huge part of, like, observational comedy. Him and George Carlin are such a huge part of that, you know? And he obviously is fucking brilliant and has done great stuff. Yeah. Just keep the shit talking to yourself. I can hear them coming out. Yeah, coming all right. Down. Uh, all right, that was fun. Uh, oh, wait. I'm in St. Louis. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm in St. Louis. Can I plug, too? Or are we just raising <laughs> money for you, you fucking jackal? Uh, I'm I in like St. Louis. Uh, jackal. <laughs> no, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> um, um, I am in St. Louis this weekend, and nobody's bought tickets, uh, so oh come to that. Um, and uh, St. Louis, Funny Bone, this weekend, and and my YouTube is uh, going going off. Lots of stuff. Check out um, the new short film, Stuck in Park. Rana loved it. Said it was fantastic. <laughs> Masterpiece. <Yeah. laughs> and, um, so go uh, subscribe to my YouTube and come see me in St. Louis. See you in St. Louis. Uh, obviously, number one, please, if you're interested in donating to a really cool movie, 
Uh, go to memoryroommovie.com right now. There's a lot of cool donation rewards. Any amount helps. We only have like two more days before the Kickstarter closes. It might actually just be one day. So do it today. Go on there. Even if it's 20 bucks. I mean, we'd love it a lot. But even if it's 20 bucks, 30 bucks will get your name in the credits. That's pretty good. Yeah. Imagine if you could pay 30 bucks to have your name in the credits for like The Godfather. That'd be cool. This is the exact same situation. So You know what's so funny about this? Yeah. Let me just point out something hilarious. Your favorite movie, all time. You've watched it every day since you were five. You're like, I've never watched the credits. <laughs> five minutes ago. I'm like, did you know about this nugget in the credits? You're like, it's my best movie. It's in my dreams. I dream about it. I've seen it more times than any movie. You will get your never name. Never watched the credits. At the very end of our movie, when they go on to shore. <laughs> but who watches the whole credits? That's a psychopath. Well, it's a visual. But anyways, we got to go. We got to well, go. Let me just the door. plug. I should also fuck. see me at Tacoma Comedy Club in two weeks. Tacoma Comedy Club. July 25th, I'll be at the Crocodile. And the b- in Seattle. Oh, I got so screwed by them. And the Baltimore, the show in Baltimore. Also, Baltimore, Tacoma. It's on, you know, is that uh, you Ron on Hirschberg.com. Yeah. They gave me, I did a show. I had 25 people there in a small room. Uh, it was a weird door deal with expenses. It's pretty big. I got a uh, $25 check. I remember. I got, well, I got a guarantee. And the feature advance. got $50 or That's $75. Crazy. It was insane. All right. We got to go. Right. People Memory waiting to come in here. Thank right. you so much. Goodbye. We'll see you good soon. Night. Bye. Good night and good luck. Joe likes Scorsese, and Ronan is Jewy. It's Joe and Ronan talk movie.